The backbone of success is hard work, determination, good planning, and perseverance. And without good planning, even a small stone can't be moved. And when we are talking about satellite, it requires immense planning and operation. So let's move on with our next session or workshop on mission planning and operation by Dr. S. Rangarajan, sir. Sir has over 36 years of experience in design and engineering of electronic system for satellites. His work include conceptual design, feasibility studies, specifying equipment, technical evaluation of vendor proposal and document, preparation of engineering standards, job specification and technology development, and satellite engineering management. Areas of specialization include telemetry, digital system design, remote sensing, satellite communication, and satellite development and manufacturing and reliability and quality assurance. Sir is here to talk on mission planning and operation. Please welcome Sir with huge round of applause. Good afternoon, friends. It gives me great pleasure to be here. Because Rajangam sir was saying in the morning, post lunch, the first session is, of course, brought with the difficulty of people have, having been had a very good lunch here in this campus. So, despite that, the topic is so interesting. I assume you'll you'll listen to it engrossed, and I like it to be very interactive. You can certainly ask me questions. If it is very urgent, you can do it in the middle and certainly at the end and at the breaks. Certainly we will do that. And um, well, when you look at the mission planning and operations, it has to planning starts from day one. That means right now what you are doing, you are planning for your nanosat. So you are already in the mission planning phase. Operations goes till the very end until the satellite is gone. Even after that, there will be certain continued operations maybe writing papers, you know, it's a full span. So when you take the entire span of the satellite uh, pre-launch and post-launch uh, phases, you come into discussing under mission. Of course, I, uh, several of the previous speakers have made my life simpler. Mr. Bokil had gone into length on how the requirements translate into specifications, blah, blah, blah. All those things are very, very much part of a mission design, mission planning. And uh, you have heard this, like Mission Mangal has become very famous there. Mission is always talked about. There is a mission impossible, but certainly ours is a mission possible. We want to show that certainly this will happen from this university anytime. Yeah, I can go to the next slide. Well, when you look at the mission, broadly you divide into segments. When you look at the segments, one is called the space segment, ground segment, and user segment. Space segment refers to the satellite and the orbit in which it is placed. The ground segment would consist of several entities, the ground stations which are participating, the control centers. The control centers in turn can be for the mission operations control center, payload operations, and so on and so forth. And uh, basically the user segment refers to the data which comes from the payload of the satellite, how that is going to be utilized. And therefore, how the data is going to be collected, data processing, data products, all those things will form part of that. How do you archive it? How to take it out like that? So that is what is indicated here. As we have been repeatedly saying, especially in the Indian context, our space program has always started from the end user. He is the one who dictates what he needs because of which the payload gets defined. From there, we move on to build the satellite around that by putting together the mainframe, then decide the launch vehicle, then launch it, and then control it from our facilities, and then start getting the data, pause it on back to the user. So the user is so central there, and unless he is comfortable with this entire program, the program would not be on. So that is always true, even whether it's a big satellite, small satellite, micro satellite, everywhere. It has to be driven by the demand, demand by the user. That is why it's very important, like Bokil was saying, to define what is your mission objective. Only thing which is a major difference here would be the cost of operation. One is the capex part in terms of choice of components and all that, which Rajangam also talked about in the uh, pre-lunch. In addition to that, there is an operational cost. That is proportional to the amount of time you operate. Maybe one year, maybe six months, maybe three years. 
But for that duration, you have an operational cost which is decided by how we are going to choose the ground segment, how we are going to control the satellite, how we are going to handle emergencies. All these things will dictate the cost of operating cost. And that has to be kept low. And that is why lots of ideas are now floating around as to how to use COTS kind of software for doing those operations. If you look at this, the mission elements encompass everything. Anything under the sky or above is all part of that because the satellite and then the orbit and then all the way to mission operations. In a typical bigger satellite, there will be a mission operations control center with so many people sitting there. But right now, this may all be done differently by individuals who may not be very experienced in that but will be trained for doing those tasks. And then the ground segment, data processing center and the users. Let me go back and ask a very fundamental question because to engineering students, this is something which they must have studied in the first semester. They read a little bit of physics and all that and want to forget it. So I want to go back to Newton's laws. Ask the question, why the satellite is in orbit? Because one thing is very clear, satellite is an object which goes around the planet, goes around the earth in our case. And therefore, the very first question comes up is, why should it go around? Why should it not fall down? Because if I drop this pointer, it falls down. Gravity. Same earth only we are talking about. Does it mean that when you go a little bit higher, 500 kilometers, there is no such gravity? That's why it's not falling down? I'm sure you, all of you know the answer. The basic point which you notice is, from one point like this, there is a pointer. Where is the pointer? Okay, doesn't matter. You take the mountain kind of thing which is shown. If you have dropped something just like that, it would have uh, fallen vertically towards the center of the earth. But if you are projecting it, if I take a chalk piece and project it, I can go up to Hathwar's level or I can go even little higher velocity. I can go even further down and fall. And at certain velocity, obviously, there will be, it will be going on a curved path and the curvature can be matched with the earth. In which case, it won't hit the earth because earth being curved. So, it keeps going round in a circle. Okay? So that is the kind of thing, the invisible link I have written on top, which says that if the gravitational force, which is what is pulling it towards the center of the earth, that is one acting. Another is the fact that Newton's first law, which says you have velocity, so it tends to go along a straight line. The two of them kind of find out the via media and then it takes a curved path. The curved path could be, in general, an ellipse. So that is what we have shown here and typically, Depending on what kind of distances you have the altitude, 150 kilometers, it is about this. And if you go further out to the moon's distance, for example, you will have about one month for that to go around. Okay? As you go further away, the period becomes more for two reasons. One is it has to cover a long distance and it travels slowly also. So both effects tend to increase the period. So that is what you see it here, continuously falling and that fall could be matched with the Earth's curvature. So, that results in types of orbits because most of the time we have assumed that our nanosat will be in a LEO because we are planning to go and uh, go in with uh, PSLV. But nevertheless, you should know that there are at least a few instances where people are already talking about some cube sats as they call the nanosats or uh, missions are available for even interplanetary missions, you know, that kind of stuff are being talked about. So, when you look at all this, you find that the low earth orbit, which where the typical uh, altitudes are in the range of something like uh, uh, 500 to 1000 kilometers, because very, very close to that, the atmospheric drag is there. So, the orbit does not last for too long. If you want a reasonable lifetime for your satellite, you have to have it a little bit in the thinner part of the atmosphere, 500, 600 kilometers is where you normally would like to keep it. And uh, then you have the MEOs, like TPS for, as an example geosynchronous and uh, geostationary, the difference I'll explain later if it comes to that. So, a geosynchronous orbit is where the satellite goes around the earth at almost the, uh, 24 hours, you know, which is the uh, rotation rate of the earth around its axis. So, since earth-based observers will have both these effects. One is the fact that because of the earth's rotation, you see astronomical objects moving. In addition, you have the satellite its own motion the two can get compensated to the extent it looks stationary. That is what we use for all those direct to home uh, television broadcasts and all that is directly relayed via a fixed point. It is not, it is actually very much moving, 
but it's moving at the same rate, as though it is uh, connected to the earth with an invisible rod. And that rod is very long, it's about 36,000 kilometers as you see here. It mostly is for communication. The difference between geostationary means perfectly stationary. Geosynchronous means over a same period as the Earth's rotation, but then it is not a perfect circular orbit, then in which case there could be some small relative motion within the whatever antenna which is receiving the signal. And so when you look at the orbits, again, you classify it by the altitude. We already discussed Leo, Mio, Geo and all that. Then you can classify it by the inclination. Because the satellite motion is in a plane, the orbital plane. The orbital plane could be equatorial, as in the geostationary orbit and all the equatorial, that moves around in the equatorial plane. Or it could be polar or near polar, or it could be anything in between, the inclined orbits could be there. The other differences which could come is in the shape of the orbit. It can be circular or it could be elliptical. That is in general, it's a, as you have known, Kepler's law of planetary motion which says, that in general, whenever a body moves in the gravitational field or the parent body, it goes in an ellipse. And therefore, in the elliptical motion, the only difference is the speed is not the same. I'm going to show you in another slide later. There, what happens is, as you would have known, if I keep this here, it has got a certain gravitational potential energy. If I push it up, potential energy goes up. So when you go to higher uh, altitude, what happens, potential energy is more that can come at the expense of the kinetic energy, which means it has to lose in velocity. So as you go to the apogee, its velocity will be lower. So the sum total of the two should be constant. Energy is conserved. So this is all what you have seen, sunlit eclipse and all that, depending on the sun's geometry with respect to the orbit. And again, in terms of applications, whether it is nanosat or bigger satellites, is always many of these are done. Because there are people who talk about communication, not in the sense of providing the geostationary orbit and all that, internet of things and getting data from that, that kind of communication or satellite to satellite communication. These are all experiments which people try to do in the communication area. Lot of remote sensing related stuff goes on from nanosats. We'll study depending on which frequency band. It's like remote sensing is nothing but taking a selfie. The earth takes a selfie and now which band you take it, whether it is visible, infrared, or UV, whatever portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, what resolution, what kind of cameras you want to carry, will decide the mission there. And it can be used for pure science as well. So the mission goals, as Bukhil had explained to you, start with the mission objectives. As you decided, OK, the university wants to build a satellite. From there, you want to go into more details of what you want to do out of that. Then you translate it into mission requirements. And then that translates in turn to what are the requirements for the different mainframe systems, for the ground segment, as well as for the launch vehicle. So the space segment, the payload and platform, to all of you are so familiar with. And you answered questions yesterday with the bus systems and then the payload systems and so on. You have all these which are very clear. And the launch window by itself doesn't come into your picture because here, basically, we are assuming that this is something like somebody else's they are tagging on to that, may not have much choice. But in missions like Chandrayaan 2, we talked about, for example, I removed the slide because today I know I will be running out of uh, time. I wanted to show it as an example of mission analysis, where if you started with your ultimate objective of landing at a point which should be in the southern region of the moon, you want it such a way that after it lands, for the next 15 days, you want it sunlit so that you have power generation. From that point, you can work out the details of what should be the orbiter, uh, what kind of orbit it should be. And that is delivered by the launch vehicle orbit, whatever it has got, and how you translate it backward, finally ending up with what should be the launch date and time. Because we have certain constraints when you launch from Freericota, you inject it at perigee, apogee comes on the other side. All these are orbital calculations, and almanac tells you where is the moon, where is the earth and every day. Put all these together, it will give you when it should launch. Otherwise, you will never know why Chandrayaan uh, cannot be launched any day of your choice. There are restrictions on what you want to do after it lands and whether you want to do some experiments. So now coming to mission planning and analysis. It's a life cycle planning, OK? From the mission objectives, the requirements to characterize the mission will include 
uh, the requirements which will translate to system development and requirement analysis for performance budgeting. As Bokil again talked about the budget in terms of the mass, in terms of let's say power, all those with propulsion if required. So all these kinds of budgeting and uh, which of these drives the system design. That's very important. Not all of them would. Of course, we have started with our basic mass limitation. But my launch vehicle will say, look, don't launch more than 10 kgs. Then that immediately says that mass budget from there, how much you can allocate for the payload. Because there are compulsory elements which are sitting there, which will all have to be correctly accommodated. That will drive the entire design there. And the quality, of course, Rajangamit discussed at length, uh, says environment and survivability. To the extent that our costs allow, you know, in the sense that not all the best can be asked for, but within our budget, how do you trade off? How do you optimize for a given budget the best kind of a mission performance? And all these things to be documented and test and evaluation of the concept on ground and simulations are very, very important. So there are a lot of pre launch activities which are all part of the mission planning. And in fact, this is what I learned when I joined. And the ISRO establishment, one of the first tasks was to go and work with the uh, ground uh, simulation facility. Bokil was there. We used to go there and look at how the satellite is performing on ground. That is what later on made us write down the procedures for how it has to be operated by the operations people at our operations control center. That's how it whole thing starts. Based on the mission objectives, you generate inputs for both spacecraft and drone system configuration. The orbit as well as the attitude, you know, we talked about the pointing accuracies, alignment and things like that. Those are all to be properly budgeted because otherwise the payload data interpretation will get into a lot of difficulty when you want to geometrically register the remote sensing imagery and all that. That is very important. And uh, uh, the TTC network, data reception, etc. <coughs> the other important point is the initial phase operations could be very different from what is done in the routine phase. Because initially, there could be some deployments, maybe the solar panel, which normally at the time of launch could have been kept close to the body because of taking the loads of the launch loads, later had to be deployed. Or the antenna, the VHF antenna, UHF antennas, all of them have to be deployed. So those kinds of things are one time, and those operations have to be carried out after it's been launched. And then you have a routine phase operation. And not but uh, last but not the least is the contingency operation. Because contingencies are unexpected occurrences which will be there and how quickly you react to that, how well documented are the procedures, whether at that time you can draw upon the expertise of people who have guided you. Like when you're a student satellite, you know that it has been guided by a team of experts. You don't want them all the time, day in and day out. But when there is a problem, immediately you should be able to call up and they will be able to tell you how one can recover from there if at all, that kind of thing. And uh, the requirements plan for training particularly for the people who will operate that. And if there is any external agency support, here in, even in the context of the nanosat, there may be external agencies which may be helping you. Because sometimes that may be the cheapest option. There may be something which is available, some volunteers who are available in Australia who may be able to collect some data and give it back to you. Or you want to study that particular payload Application may require that fisheries, you want to validate it by doing it elsewhere outside the country. Luckily, all these LEOs, the ones which we are targeting, are never over only one region. Automatically, they move across the globe, covering various parts of the globe. Okay, and alert systems and the things like that. And uh, the detailed planning is a very important thing of writing down the procedures. So it's not only for the ground operations, what Bokil talked about, how important it is to document, how each and every step must be written down and you go step by step, somebody else overseeing it. Same thing happens even after it's launched. Suppose you want to carry out a particular operation, it may be initial phase or routine phase, the operations have to be clearly written down as prerequisites and what are the step one, step two, step three what confirmation, which telemetry word has to be checked, and etc., etc., and cleared by a group of experts. So that should have happened as part of the review team. At the time when satellite hardware is getting ready, you should have all these procedures also be ready. That's what we are talking about, the flight sequences, etc. The data display schemes, how you 
do it in real time and near real time, and how do you analyze the data and all that is very important and things like that. The health analysis, because very often we always refer to, in fact, I remember I'm talking about a child being there. In fact, we always, all the mission control people look at, we use the word health analysis because we believe each and every satellite up there is like a child and you are taking care of it. Generally, the child never, it does, it's very intelligent, it does everything nicely. But once in a while it may trip, fall down, you must immediately take it and put it to proper kind of a condition. <clears throat> so the ground control of space missions, tracking stations, anyway, Hathwar will be talking more about uh, the what kind of visibilities, uh, AOS, LOS, etc., how much time it will be available at what elevations, etc., whether you use more than one station for this, what antenna should be used, etc., etc., and uh, what kind of operational issues should be discussed. Uh, one other thing in terms of the nano satellites is in terms of uh, simplifying the operations because you cannot have three shift uh, people sitting there and looking at the data and react. So very many things can be automated and luckily over this period of time the kind of computer software uh, developments are so good it is possible to do things with simple our laptop computer, you'll be able to manage many things. That part of it is what we are doing. The controller's task should be made very much simpler. I'm going to give some examples later. And uh, uh, especially in terms of uh, mission software, which includes health monitoring, flight dynamics, etc., are more important for uh, bigger missions. Because here, you just put it in an orbit. You may not be able to maintain the orbit. But nevertheless, you should have information about how the orbit is decaying. Because for interpreting the data, you need to know the latest orbital parameters and so on. That is what you have to do that. And uh, training the operational personnel using the ground test procedures and simulators. Okay. And uh, basically, we would prefer an intelligent monitoring system so that the number of people required is less. All the complexity is transferred to the software. And the ground automated software is something which can be used and there is enough expertise with a group of experts here and we will definitely help you. Just like you design the onboard computer thing, typically you see what should be the ground control system which should take care of it. I want to give one quickly, one example each of uh, an operation which is not relevant directly for a nanosat. I am going to finally summarize it, but just to know in order to carry out any operation, there will be a lot of planning which will have gone in and then how do you execute it? Because this you will see time and again when you look at, you know, unfortunately yesterday was supposed to have been a launch which got postponed. But when it happens, you will notice that one of the things which will happen from MCF, whether it's Bhopal, Hassan, it will always be a lot of activities, a lot of media reports which says the launcher successfully launched it in a particular orbit. After that, it has been brought in to the final orbit in the next couple of days, one week or ten days. Why does it take that much time? What do you do? That's what I wanted to show. See, in the geostationary orbit, maybe it's final home, but the launch vehicles which we have, including the GSLV, will never launch a satellite into the geostationary orbit. The reason for that is geostationary orbit is a circular orbit at 36,000 kilometers, and no launch vehicle ever wants to go to such large distances. Because launch vehicles, you know, we used to be joking when we used to go to Ariane space, where we used to have the first few inset launches used to take place. They all will sit in their control center consoles and then will start all the operations. In 20 minutes or so, they will see the first satellite separated. 21st minute, second satellite separated. They all will clap. And typical of all the French people, they will open the champagne. They will all enjoy so. Whereas I was in charge of MCF. My real, the birth of the baby was at that instant. All the things start at that moment. When it's correctly injected, we have to worry about whether it's in the right attitude, whether power is coming up, and whether we can acquire it. All the things start for the satellite controllers. Whereas for the launch vehicle people, we collect the check and go. Thank you. We'll see you in the next launch. So the launch vehicle phase is very, very short. And therefore, they don't put you in the geostationary orbit and all. The only thing they do is, okay, you want to go to geostationary orbit, I will put it in an orbit, so that once in an orbit, you will go to the geostationary height. I can't give you all the time. At least once in each revolution, let me take it to that height. So the apogee, the farthest point, will be at geostationary height. 
Piriji, where they inject, is very close, maybe 200 kilometers or so. They take it up to 200 kilometers, like GSLV, takes it over Indonesia. You know, there's a station called Biak, uh, Hathwar knows it. And in fact, I was the one we went and selected the station. And uh, this particular thing over that, the GSLV will go there. And at uh, the height of some 200 or 180 kilometers, it will say that I am done. All my firings are over. Now cryogenic stage is all shut down. So now the satellite is on its own. Bye-bye. That is how the launch vehicle says bye-bye. And from then on, how do you acquire it? That is what I wanted to just show you quickly. Because I was mentioning, if in an elliptical orbit, if you are at the perigee, where the potential energy is least, the kinetic energy is the highest, and apogee is the opposite. So you look at an orbit like this, look at this, the, the close to the Earth, which is at 200 kilometers, it has a 10.3 kilometers per second velocity, whereas when it same orbit, when it goes to the apogee, it comes down to 1.57 kilometers per second. Okay? So if instead of that 1.57 kilometers, if there are 3.074 kilometers per second, then it will not be in this elliptical orbit, it will be in a circular orbit. So what all is required of this propulsion system is at the apogee point, you fire the propulsion uh, system in such a way that you increase the velocity. How do you increase the velocity? In any body, suppose jet principle, no? So uh, yesterday I already saw somebody answering what is specific impulse and all that. So you all know all about propulsion. So you know very well a liquid motor can be fired at the apogee point or close to the apogee point. So imparting a push so that the velocity keeps increasing and increase not in immediately, liquid engines can be stopped and started. So in three such firings, you will get it to a circular orbit. So that is what you see it here in the next slide. See here, there is a LAM, is a liquid apogee motor, it is fired at the apogee and that increases the speed from that 1.57 kilometer per second which was delivered by the launch vehicle to 3 plus kilometer per second which is the final requirement in maybe three stages to calibrate it and all that. So that's what happens. Only after that you start deploying arrays and all. So this is one of the very important missions. I want all of you, having gone through this workshop, should enjoy that. When this comes up, every day there will be a news item coming from MC Fasen saying that yes, first firing is done, present orbit is of maybe 20 hours uh, period, it has got apogee of this, perigee. Apogee is almost there, uh, it was already there. Perigee raised from 200 kilometers to 10,500 kilometers, something like that. You should read all that and how it keeps moving around. So this is the kind of uh, initial phase operation. The entire operation, including this, from the day of launch, will be typically one week. After that, the testing of the payload will start. I wanted to give you, uh, and for supporting that, until you go to geostationary, you realize that there is a relative motion between the Earth and the satellite, and therefore, you can't receive the signal from the satellite from the same station all the time. Hassan cannot receive or Bhopal cannot receive. So we need to have a network of stations and collect the data and send it by other means to bring it to the control facility. And that's all done. And usually you use these kinds of stations for this purpose. Mission analysis, only one small example. Yeah, this is just to tell you in the remote sensing area, for example, one of the important things you realize is you have a LEO, you have a low earth orbiting satellite, so its period may be, let's say, 100 minutes. If it's 100 minutes, it keeps going round. Initially, it is the same orbit, but earth is rotating at that rate, no, 24 hours, it makes one revolution. So over one period, what would happen about, you know, every uh, four minutes, one degree means 100 uh, minutes, about 25 degrees, the longitude at the equator will shift. So if it has imaged over, let's say, eastern part of India, the next uh, pass may be over the western part, then it goes over uh, the Middle East, then into Africa East, Africa West, like that it moves. In 14 revolutions or so, it will come back with 100 minutes and 1440 is their total duration in a day. So it will come back to this uh, original point nearby. But in remote sensing, finally you want to image the entire country without gaps. So therefore, you have to plan very carefully. When you finish 14 orbits and come back, you comes over very close to the first orbit, but you don't want it to coincide exactly there because in this case, exactly there, you will keep on imaging every day and that is not what we want. We want to image whatever was missed between the first and the second, that gap should be filled up with 
more and more. So the, the whole this thing is a CCD camera. So it does improving. You can go to the next level to next level. with some little overlap. You cover the entire uh, country. And if you do it for India, it uh, happens for all over the world. That is what I have shown here. Now I'll almost coming to the end of this. Okay. Yeah, particularly there are a lot of uh, things which affect the orbit. What is important for me, I have written here, nano satellites with no orbital correction capability. It is very important to understand flight dynamics. More than the other case, flight dynamics might be done by the flight dynamics expert. They will maintain the same orbit. You don't have to worry. Here, everyone should understand what is happening to the orbit, how the orbit is, let's say, decaying. Temperature will change. Its inclination may change. It uh, ellipticity may come up. All those must be usually predictable or it can be generated and then you can take the data. So nobody will do a ranging and all that. And the, from the prediction, you should keep on publishing the result and use it for interpreting the data. Because unless you know the orbit, that is where from you are viewing the Earth, for example, that platform, its orbit and orientation should be known in order to interpret the results. You know, that is why orbital information is important. Otherwise, for other things like uh, the geostationary orbit, you have station keeping, etc., and the fuel is used and the budgeting takes place. Yeah, station keeping, east, west, and north. So, in summary, we start from the definition of the mission objectives and generate the preliminary estimate of mission needs, the requirements, as well as the constraints. Alternate mission concepts and architectures are arrived at which are the basic system drivers and finally the utilization of the mission. If you are doing this, nanosats, there is a lot of trade-offs which are required. One of them is to lower the operating cost as I was mentioning, which means that you use among other things peer-to-peer -to -peer There are a lot of people who are available. Originally it was amateur radio people you used to help. Here also are a number of agencies which are willing to help student community. They won't charge you exorbitantly, they will say we will collect the data and give it to you. As long as it is not very critical, you can get the data after little bit delay, they would not mind supporting you. So, you look at all those options. You have to also uh, talk about number of uh, newer techniques include TCP IP kind of thing because of the IP based uh, technologies. There are people who use that kind of communication protocols even in the satellite um, related operations. Uh, outsourced ground support also available. You don't have any ground support depending on what band you are using. There are a number of people who are willing to do the TTNC for you because you don't have to expect too many of commands and all that. If there is an emergency, they will, you can always use them like that. That kind of possibilities are talked about in the latest thing. And uh, there are very interesting concepts like this. Uh, today, in the Vice Chancellor, we were discussing how there is going to be a very, very big Leo constellation which is going to come up. Okay, one web type of concept. If that happens, then what you can do is forget about all these ground based support. You can always relay the information. You put its corresponding modem on the uh, nanosat, in which case it will communicate with the nearest member of the constellation. And the constellation is always supported by its own ground stations and they will get you the data. This will be a very new way of approaching this because nobody has yet done it. Uh, I wrote Iridium at the time, but now it can be even better choices are there. Iridium is only 66 satellites. We, here we are talking about thousands of satellites, which will form a very dense network and with a lot of capabilities to pull the data to that. They will be very close to our satellite. That is right. And then the mobile phone usage is becoming very, very common in terms of visualizing the, the orbital geometry or the, if there is a payload, the payload, uh, how it is projecting on the ground. All those things, very much simple softwares are there and the apps are available and you run those apps, you will be able to get the kind of thing. I know how smart the younger kids are. Like I had such a difficult time in getting something done on my phone, but your, one of your volunteers did it within two minutes. They were able to solve the problem. So I am sure that mobile phones is something which is part of your second habit. Therefore, it will come very nicely. And uh, cloud, the whatever is available, there are many of these operations can be done using the cloud and the uh, MATLAB also has some tools specifically for the student satellites. 
they are trying to provide ways by which you can visualize, you can do some control and things like that. And uh, important to have the satellite behavior. That is, we talked about the interplay. Today, uh, Bukhil made a very interesting thing that all of them should work homogeneously. What is it called? Your uh, peaceful coexistence. He talked at the level of integration. When you talk about the mission, it will be peaceful coexistence until the grave. You, know, you have to have it fully coexisting even when you are operating it. When you want to coexist, that can be tested using software. So you easily put in your power system, you see the orientation, everything you put in the software. Some of the students can easily generate these kind of things. And once you generate it, you can simulate how it, is, it will perform and how you would react to that. You know, that training also it will happen. It will be used in contingencies. Very useful to have that software. And uh, the ground station is either fixed or mobile cord and I can be there to a mission control. Uh, TT and C, anyway, Hathwar uh, will talk about that. Uh, I talked about peer to peer. And uh, the same security, reliability, latency, etc., may not be there. But that is what you are, you are aware of it right in the beginning. When, uh, like apples to oranges, when you pay for the orange, you get the orange. That kind of thing. So you are aware of it. So you are not going to say, look, the ISRO's mission was such a great uh, reliability. I am getting two nines are missing from out of that. It is okay. But your dollar, uh, rupees wise, we are say, uh, saving five, six zeros at the other end. The idea is to lower operational cost by adopting intelligent schemes. And uh, so you, nothing can be better than student community like here to have the intelligent schemes. You should come out with that and we will only support you. I can take some questions also. So I normally like to interact. Um, since we are running short of time, really, I know, maybe if there are some questions, certainly we can take it. Uh, otherwise, after Atwa's talk also, I can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is the, the old orbit, it becomes new orbit because of a thrusting action. And the thrusting action is instantaneous as far as the calculation is concerned. In reality, for example, suppose the lamb firing, you know, the liquid apogee motor, it's a liquid motor and it is 450 Newton, that is the kind of thrust level. So it fires for something like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. That is taken as only one point as far as the calculations are concerned, but usually it's a small duration. The thrusting is for a short duration which changes the velocity before and velocity after are different and therefore the orbit before and orbit later are different. See the orbit is, um, let me go with a little bit of a, uh, I am a physics guy, I have to tell that it is basically a solution of a second order differential equation, Newton's law, you know, uh, disc, uh, acceleration equal to that position type of the force. When you solve that you require two uh, initial conditions, namely position and velocity. Since you are doing the maneuver at a given position, position is common to both for orbit 1 and orbit 2. Velocity is different, it will give you a different position, different orbit. So you change the orbit instantaneously as far as theoretically. Actually, it depends on the propulsion, how long you will fire.